Hello everyone. Um, I'm so happy that Maya was before me because then I can skip a part of the slides um, and it's going to be an intense session as it is. Um, so let's just dive in. So the plan is, or at least the plan used to be, that we're going to cover the IP basics, which we're going to skip. Um, and then that we're going to dive directly into the use cases when it comes to uh, software and uh, then I think the open source licenses in more or less detail. Um, and then in the first section of the presentation, in the first hour, we're going to, yeah, we're going to look into how you can mark your own piece of software, uh, how to mark your own work, um, including with a practical demonstration of how you can make that easy. So there's tools that make things easier. Um, then hopefully we will have time for a short break um, and in the next hour we will look into inbound licensing and uh, license compatibility. So things you need to take into consideration when you are using stuff you found on the internet. Because nobody does that. Okay, so we're going to skip this. Um, you can read the slides when you uh, later on. Um, I'm going to distribute the slides. Um, but the important thing is, just as with Maya, you can and should interrupt me um, because very, very quickly things will become really complicated um, and if you don't understand a specific slide in the deck, um, the rest will maybe be a bit hard to follow. So if you have any doubts or questions, just shout out um, and we'll address it um, during the presentation. So, starting with copyright, because copyright is the main, not the only, but the main thing that governs uh, intellectual property rights when it comes to software. As Maya already explained, there's four ways how you can get um, a right to use a piece of copyright work, in this case, software. So the first one is obviously you're the author, so you have the copyright yourself. The second one is that you got the rights assigned to you, either through a copyright assignment agreement or through a contributor license agreement for a copyright license. The third one is you get a license. Um, and the fourth one is you have the law, you know, in our case, the Zakon Alpha, so the copyright law gives you an exception or a statutory license to do that. Spoiler alert for software. Nah, not very applicable. There is very, very few uh, statutory rights you get, or statutory exceptions you can rely on uh, when it comes to software. So, practical thing is, this is the one you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to use a lot. So, short version, if there's no license attached, you're not going to use it. At least not legal. Okay, so here's one of the first important slides. Um, when it comes to software development or development in general, um, you have, uh, you, you guys are aware of the supply chain or any like supply chain or development process where you have your uh, upstream or your suppliers and then you do something with it within your organization and then, then you have the downstream, so your customers or your end users or the general public. So the code or any other thing flows from you know, your inputs, you do something with it, and then you have the outputs. Um, so with inbound code, so with software that flows into your organization, you also have uh, inbound licenses attached to it. So each piece of software has, has to have, you have to have rights to use that so if it's flowing into you, we call that an inbound license. And vice versa, if for any software you release yourself, we call that an outbound license because it flows together with the code, it flows outside of your organization. Make sense? Okay, cool. So there's two typical use cases when it comes to um, software use. Um, Basically, the first one is the one you will find if you read like law books on uh, licensing and software, 
stuff like that is what I call the traditional or best of this tradition. So this is it's called like that because um, that's the more that this use case when you get a when you get for example through a USB or a CD uh, or through the internet you get a copy of the software. Uh, you get a copy of the app and install it on your desktop, you install it on your mobile phone, etc. Um, so, the, here, as my explained, the distribution step happens because you received a copy, and the copy is on your machine, you actually have it. Um, on the other side, you have what is now quite popular um, SaaS, which stands for Software as a Service. So, the interesting thing about SaaS is the end user is not using the software, they're using the service. It's just that software, somewhere in the magical cloud sphere, um, there's a server that runs the software, but the end user doesn't have access to the software at all. They just have access to a service. So that is a different use case. Um, and in that case, it's also a distinction whether you have a front-end user interface that uh, the end user can interact with or not. Um, so if it's a front-end or a back-end solution. We'll get into that uh, later on. So two things that are important here is um, that for a traditional distribution, for the, in the traditional distribution use case, we also count over-the-air updates. So updates you get through the internet, it's also distribution, uh, as well as client-side JavaScript. So even if the solution, the software is served as a service, if it also sends Java client-side JavaScript to your browser, and that browser then interprets the, the JavaScript to do something with the website, that is also traditionally distributed. You guys are surprisingly quiet. <laughs> I'm going to assume you're super smart. Um, so, enter FOSS. What is, what is FOSS? So, open source, um, and I use the term interchangeably. So, you will see here some people say free software, others will say open source software, others will say libre software, others will say FOSS. Um, it's all the same. It's all the same. There, we can dive like, during the break, if anybody is really into this, uh, we can discuss the historical and political intrigues. Why there are different words? Same crap! Um, but ultimately, from the practical standpoint, it's the same. Um, also of note is that even though it's a free software, it doesn't mean it's gratis. You can charge for the software. Um, you're not allowed to charge for the license, but that's a legal technical detail. Okay, so what's an open source of FOSS or whatever license? So any piece of software that is open source has to give you the four freedoms, so the four rights. The right to use the code for whatever purpose you want, uh, to study what the code does, which means that you need to get access to the source code to analyze what the code actually does, uh, to share the original code that you got from your upstream with your downstream, so to share the code with others in its original form, um, as well as improve the code, so to change and modify the code um, to suit your needs or you know, fix bugs or whatever you want, and of course also to share that with others. So those are the four things like every open source license gives you. If, if it fails any of the four, it's not open source. Simple as that. I don't know. Okay. So, now that that's coming. <laughs> um, this is the most complicated slide in the whole deck. Um, if you understand that, you're going to understand a lot about this thing, field in general. Um, so, first we have, as you can see, like, this is the, this is the overview of the traditional distribution uh, um, use case. Um, on this side, you will see we have the four rights, the four freedoms, so use, study, share, and group. 
Um, and up here you will see there, uh, there are different uh, legal situations. So on this side we have the least, the least permissive, the most restrictive, uh, which is by default um, if a piece of software is just under copyright. And on the other extreme end we have the public domain, which is, as Maya said, 70 years after the death of the author, it falls into public domain, you can do with it whatever the hell you want, uh, which is great. Uh, so it obviously gives you all the four freedoms. Uh, you can use, study, share, and improve it. And you don't even need to say who you got the code from, which is cool. So that's public domain. And then in between, we have the open source licenses, uh, which we uh, divide into permissive and copyleft. Okay, so let's start with copyright, because Maya already explained this, and also it's the default. Uh, why I put the default in quotes is because in practice, there's very, very few occasions where you will legally obtain a piece of software that will not have a license attached. But for the, for the sake of this uh, presentation, let's assume that's what happened. So, um, as I said, let's assume we have a piece of software from our upstream. Um, and why I'm waving always in this direction makes sense and will make sense in 10 seconds. Um, and we got it from, from, from this column. So here we have the situation. So the computer is our computer um, that we installed the software on. Um, the genie represents the magical internet thing of where we found crap. Um, and the blue person here is our downstream. So as you can see, we have our upstream, and then it flows through us, which is in the middle, and then we have our downstream, which is the blue guy. So this column is our inbound situation, and this column is our outbound situation. So if a piece of software is under copyright and there's no license attached to it, the weird thing is, by law, you can use it for whatever purpose you want. So you don't need a license to use a piece of software as long as you legally obtain it. Good luck with that, but if this is the situation you're in, you can actually use it. Um, because the copyright resides with whoever wrote it in the first place, um, you do not have the right to copy, so you cannot share it. And because you cannot copy, you also cannot have a downstream. You cannot copy it, give it to others. So, you know, our inbound situation is uh, we can use it for whatever purpose, but we cannot copy it, and therefore we also are not able to give it or our modifications of it to others. In fact, under copyright law itself, um, we are also not allowed to modify it, but there is a note attached here, as well as here, which is that uh, according to most European laws, uh, no, to European EU laws, in it, um, you, there is a thin exception that for interoperability reasons, uh, you have a way of of uh, legally decompiling or reverse engineering the code and modifying it to fix some issues or to make it work within your uh, organization. Um, this is usually the last resort if you cannot figure out with the copyright holder how to, how to fix it, but it's there. Any questions? Because this was the most important part. Um, can you give us an example, like a specific software? Like for my case, I use satellite images. Like I usually use the free one, open source, like Google Earth Pro. But I know that Google Earth, Earth Pro also purchased the satellite images from a specific um, company. And as a researcher, I also use that one. So which do you think uh, that one falls to? I mean, again, the first first um, answer is um, this is the question of software, not, not in the So it's not, it doesn't fall in that. No, but so, but it, yeah, yeah, but it's still it's still a good question. So I would say, for example, 
most 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 websites like GitHub, etc., will have terms of services which will also be with some licensing, etc., etc. So let's assume you found a piece of software on somebody's personal website. So, for example, from some other university, uh -huh. uh, their personal website on some other university, and said, "Oh, I wrote this for my research. Here's the code." And that's it. Here's the code. Um, and there is no license in the software, there is no license on his website, there is no terms and conditions that you have to read through. So that would be the situation. You legally retain the piece of code because they published it on their website, um, but, you know, all you can go on is the copyright, or in practice you mail the other research, you send them an email and say what's the license for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is this a part of some publicly available document? Um, I, have, I will share the slide deck. Uh -huh. But this is mine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, you are the creator of this chart because I think I, I would like to reuse this. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I I published it somewhere under CC by. Uh -huh. So. Okay. Great. If not, I'll send me an email and I'll send you the original. Okay. Okay. Um. But. Okay. Uh, when you talk about downstream software, is it like uh, installing the software to a paying client or letting a client use a service on a server where I use the software? So the ser using it ser using it as service on your server would be the next use case, ah, not yeah, this yeah. graph. Right. Um, so we're talking about like the downstream would be either you publish it on the website or, or GitHub, yeah. so it's publicly available, or you you know give it to a client under certain conditions and they pay you or they don't pay you, it doesn't matter. So it just goes outside of your organization to somebody else. So there's a copy that you. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. So requests to the server that uses that software to install. That's going to be the next okay, yeah. slide. Yeah. All right. Okay. We have the Cool. Um. So the same scheme is the same in the other part. So we're going to skip to the other extreme to public domain because that's the other default, which again doesn't apply to software because how many. Lawyer, uh, how many how many authors of um, useful software uh, have died seventy years ago, and their software is still useful? Um, <laughs> but you know, let, 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 let's entertain the thought. So as I said, like if you get a piece of software that is actually in public domain, um, then uh, you can do whatever you want with it. And because you can do whatever you want to with it and don't even need to attribute who you got it from or who the original author was, um, you don't need to forward any of those rights to your downstream, but you can. Okay. It's a free world. If you want to, you can do it, but you are under no obligation. Um, so you can, you, know, you can find a piece of software online that's in public domain, good luck, but uh, and then you can do with it whatever you want, and you can you know even sell it as closed source. You can change the name, you can do whatever you want. Um, as Maya said, um, you cannot dedicate a piece of software or a work um, under Slovenian law to public domain. Um, but there are two or uh, licenses that come close. So CC zero um, does. So by default, CC0 is a copyright waiver, so it dedicates it to a public domain, but it does have a third clause that says, if that is not possible, then this defaults to a super permissive license. Um, and the same is true with unlicensed. The only caveats are the, oh, we'll get to the caveats later. Um, so, okay, so next, Thing we will look into is permissive licenses like uh, MIT, the BSD licenses, Apache, and as Maya said, Creative Commons Attribution. Um, those are basically try to replicate the public domain uh, within a 
still existing copyrights situation. So again, because it's an open source, now we're in the open source field, right? Because it's open source, you get the right to use, study, share, and improve the code you got from the gene. Do whatever you want with it. Um, and if you then distribute it to your downstream, you, similar to the public domain, you can forward those rights to your downstream or not. Um, okay. Um, so now we're going to into copy that. We're first going to look at what we, you know, fine grained all the strong copy left, but it's what before the second thing popped up was the only copy left. Uh, for example, like the GPL, so the general public license, uh, the federal GPL, the European Union public license, and uh, and non-code, uh, it would be Creative Commons uh, attribution share of that. So again, open source. So use study, share, and improve. You can do with that uh, with the code whatever you want, under the condition that what the, the whatever you did with the code, uh, the final product, so the work where the code that you got under, for example, the GPL ended up with, the whole work needs to be under the same license. So the idea is uh, that you need to forward the same rights that you obtained also to your downstream. So that means that if I, for example, take a piece of code under the GPL, then uh, create a software around it uh, that heavily relies on that, and I want to release that to the public or to you know give it to a friend, I need to give it the whole thing under the GPL license also to my friend or the general public. Hey, I want to ask something about the permissive and the public domain. Uh, could you have the question mark? Uh, is that because you can uh, change the license uh, for so that it will be distributed to a second user? So, and uh, you know, restrain them from uh, doing something like a share it to a third party? Um, yes, that's one of the reasons. So, the, with strong popular effect, here in the proprietary part, with, the, with for example, with copyright, you cannot <laughs> give the rights. So if the, the second user wants, uh, wants, uh, wants it to, has to go to the original with user? The, with the copyright, yes, they need yes. to go to the original. With, with copyleft, like the GPL, um, they get it from you under the same license as you got it. And under permissive or public domain, under permissive, um, they can get it from you if you're willing to give it to them. Um, and you can decide under which conditions. So you can change the license or um, you can just decide not to. Okay. Um, so the difference between strong and weak copyleft is only that weak copyleft is limited in scope. So, for example, the lesser general public license, the zero public license, and the Eclipse public license are basically what happened is they figured out, okay, or in some cases it's a bit tedious that you require the whole work to be also released under the same license. Um, so they said, okay, maybe it's enough if we limit it to just the piece of code that matters. So for example, um, in the case of um, LGPL, that's limited to the library. So if you if you download a library under uh, LGPL and then include it into your software, you, and then distribute the whole thing further, all you need to do is make sure that your downstream gets access to the library, the original library that you got, um, and any modifications you might have made to the library. Um, that they get that under the LGPL license. So you need to comply with the LGPL license only for the library, but not for the rest of the work uh, that's uh, in it. Um, Mozilla public license and the new Eclipse public license make it even easier because 
they explicitly say that they apply only to the files where it says. So only if, if in a source code file it says this uh, file is under MPL2, then only that file is under MPL2. And whatever you write around it in all the other files, it doesn't apply to that. Uh, Makes sense? Any other fast? We might actually have time for all the demos. Cool. Um, so some of you might have noticed that um, there's something even more extreme um, than copyright, which is the EULA. So the EULA stands for End User License Agreement. Um, and the reason why it exists <laughs> and uh, why it's called an agreement is uh, because of this little thing here. As I said, as long as you legally obtain a piece of software, you can use it for any purpose you want. Some companies don't like that. So uh, what happened is they created the end user license agreement. I mean, in, uh, there's like, with open source licenses, there's a lot of them, but at least there's a finite number of them. With ULAS, there's an infinite amount of EULAs and they have very little in common between themselves. But what makes a EULA a EULA is typically that they try to get to get you to agree to, uh, to to have less rights than the copyright law itself would give you. So, for example, like typically it would mean you only get a license, you can only use the piece of software for a certain amount of time. You can only use it on that specific computer and if you change the disk, well, good luck, you need to buy a new license. Um, so that's possible because of the EULA. And um, here's the thing is, to a EULA, because it's an agreement, uh, to a, because you get less rights than what the law would give you, this means that you need to agree with that. So you need to agree with the other party, which in this case would be the company that is issuing the EULA, uh, you need to agree that you will, you are okay with getting less rights than stock copyright gives you. Uh, and that's why you need to click on I agree or checkbox or sign stuff uh, when it comes to EULAs. And that's also the reason why for open source licenses, you don't have to click I agree or uh, sign stuff, etc. Because um, by definition, a license is something that gives you more rights than the copyright or than the, the law itself gives you. And because you get more rights, there is nothing you need to agree with. You just need to follow the obligations um, and you only lose the right if you didn't follow the obligations, but there's nothing you... You're, by using a piece of open source software, uh, you are not losing anything. Make sense? All right. Will be the most stupid question in the world, the most obvious one. How is Eula fair? Who gives them the right to own this agreement rights? Uh, I mean, it's somebody that can say, "Come on, guys, sorry, that reason." Um, it's not, but that's why it's an agreement, and that's why most people don't read agreements even when they're signing. You know. Let's be honest. I mean, most people don't even read the agreement when they're signing when they're signing an agreement to buy an apartment, and that's a bit more important than a piece of software. So nobody reads, apart from some some poor lawyers, uh, nobody reads deals. Um and that's how they got around with it. And they just made it a common thing, and everybody's yeah, 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 you along, you know, okay, I agree. Um, but yes, it's it's. I would argue it's not fair. Um, but that's how back can we get to this argument? Um, not very far because you agree with it. I mean, there's always the option that you don't agree and don't use it, <laughs> and then find 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 one of the solutions that are under a. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um. So now we're getting to the SAS part. So, any question, because we're moving to the next slide otherwise. No? One, two, three. One question. There are versions of the software that you can use to find human software. Which part of the 
So the thing is, like, when it comes to software, like every version, like even you could even say, like, even on the commit level, uh, like every version of the software is its own piece of work. It's, if it's its own, like you would say, you have a book, and then there was a new version of the book that had like you know, a few things changed. It's two different books. It's the same with software. It's just that it just moves so fast that nobody actually cares that there's like it's not a piece of it's not. You know, it's not Firefox that's a piece of work. It's like Firefox at that specific point of time, and Firefox at that specific point of time, etc., etc., etc. So beta version would be just one of those, and then it just depends on which license the copyright holders decided to put it under. Um, they might put it under a EULA. They might put it under a, uh, a copyleft or a permissive license. From the legal point of view, it's the same as any other. There are some there are some things that are called um, preparatory works, um, but those are and there's some special things we talk about that. But that's not that's way 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 before even an alpha version. That's before you even start writing code. So when you have like okay, so this is you know the schematics. That's how I think it's gonna work. Um, so those would be also protected by copyright, um, but okay. All right, now we get to the SAS part. So I will move between the two slides because this will make sense more this way. So one obvious thing is that the computer changed to the cloud. So suddenly uh, we are now installing the piece of third-party software, we're not installing it on our computer, we're installing it on a server in the magical cloud um, that we own. So we have access to that cloud, it's ours. Um, and then, so the second thing is that the end user is not actually getting a copy because they're just using, they're accessing uh, the service uh, through a browser or some other means of internet. Um, so that's the distinction. And what happens here is that for most part, it doesn't matter. But, um, so like, because it will be hidden on the server anyway. But here is where the shift happens. Is we have a change between what I call the traditional uh, strong copy lab and weak copy lab, and what I call the SAS strong copy lab and weak copy lab. So what happens is, like, all of the standard strong copy that licenses, uh, GPL, LGPL, etc., suddenly moved to weak copy that. And the only things that stay here as a strong copy that are AGPL and EUPL, so a federal general public license and the European Union public license. The thing is that um, copy that typically triggers on distribution, and because there's no distribution, you have this magical cloud thingy here um, that occurs. It doesn't trigger. So, what we happen is that if you have a code under GPL and you put it on a server, um, and people, for example, like WordPress, WordPress is a great example. WordPress is really something. Uh, if you install WordPress on the server and you have users use your WordPress in an instance um, to, you know, create blogs or whatever on that server. Um, they, are, they did not get a copy, it was not distributed, and they're just using the service. So, because they didn't receive a copy, um, the copyright, the copy lab didn't trigger. Um, if you did, and this is why I put it into the SAS link copy lab, if you did give them a copy of it, then they would again have the same rights as here. But because you don't, if they don't get the rights. Um, with AGPL and EUPL specifically, um, the trigger is, uh, another trigger is introduced, uh, which specifically says that if you use that piece of software 
through a front, uh, through, through a interface, a uh, web interface or, or network interface, um, that it triggers. And again, you need to give them the same freedoms as you got, so the same rights as you got. So, for example, if you um, install like something like Nextcloud on a server and you create accounts for some friends. Um, uh, they can ask you for source code to your next cloud instance because that one is released under the AGDL. And then you need to give them a copy of it. Uh, we'll go into the details later on, but that's it. Um, okay, any questions on this slide? Everything else is basically the same. So that's an important distinction. Okay, you got through the worst part of the presentation. Congratulations. Now we're only left with the more typical legal questions, like what are the rights and obligations of open source licenses? So for permissive licenses like BSD and MIT, um, you, as I said, you receive all the four rights of use, study, share, and improve you receive uh, from your upstream. So if you use it, a package under the MIT license, you can do all of those things with it. Um, and once you mix it with your own code, you can release the whole thing under any license you want, even proprietary. That's what makes it permissive. Um, and because it's up to you whether you want to give them the same rights that you received or not, you are not under an obligation to give them the source code. Um, you can do so if you want to, but just as you can give them the, a copy if you want to, um, it's just a right you have, not an obligation. What you need to do is you need to include the text of the license, so the text of the MIT license in this case, um, because as established, the license is the thing that gives you the right to do all this in the first place. If there is a license missing, we fall back to the copyright situation. Um, and you need to keep all the not copyright notices and author notices in place, as Maya explained, because of a law, um, in our Pennsylvania case, or in most European Union countries case, um, and b, most of the licenses require that as well. Then, um, the other big group, as we said, is the copyleft uh, group. Um, where you again also receive all the new study sharing and proof uh, rights, and, but you need to, once you shuffle the code around and you know, introduce new stuff and new sub stuff, etc., etc., um, the output, so the resulting code, needs to be under the same license. Um, so you need to forward the same rights to your downstream. Um, and which means you also need to include, to give them the source code to whatever needs to be released as um, uh, needs to be uh, uh, under the same license. Um, and again, keep the copyright notices and uh, author notices, ship notices. And some licenses like the GPL require you to also track changes and include a list of changes with usually the dates. So what you what what did you change in the original code and uh, when? Um, to be fair, I think that's a good idea regardless of the license it's under, but the GPS specifically demands that. I don't think anybody actually got into really, really serious trouble for not doing that, but in theory, you could get sued for not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so the difference, so you will hear like on forums, especially with, um, with, with all these discussing licenses, uh, you will hear the question which one of the two groups is more free or more open. Um, but the, the general gist is that um, permissive licenses like the BSD and MIT um, stress the importance of um, the freedom of the developer. So if you receive a piece of code under a permissive license, you're free to do whatever you want, even if you want to release it under most <coughs> uh, software later on. On the other hand, um, the copyleft licenses uh, stress the importance of uh, the freedom of the code. So what they want to do is 
that they want to make sure that the code that was once available for free for everybody to use uh, and improve remains free to be reused and re improved later on. So what matters most is more of a question of what you care more about um, and the situation. I wouldn't say one is worse than the other. Okay, so far you look slightly tired, but other than that, you look well. So let's go into some lesson details. Let's see if I can kill you with that. So first thing, as I already mentioned, um, and I think Maya did as well. No, she did. Uh, so use for use, you do not need a license, which means that if you get a piece of so there's a, there's a misconception that as soon as you introduce a piece of GPL code into the organization, all hell will break loose and you will need to release the source code to everything in the organization, to the general public, and that just push. So if you install like uh, a piece of GPL software on your laptop um, and it's a university stuff, um, as long as you just use it, because you didn't distribute it further, you didn't give a copy to somebody else, um, it doesn't matter because there are no, the, the, the copy that uh, trigger didn't trigger. So you are just using it. Um, and use is okay by law. So in fact, um, you can use a piece of software as long as you're just using it, not modifying, not copying further to others, but as long as you just need to install a piece of software on, your, on a machine and use it. Um, any open source license is okay because the open source license allows you to install it and use it um, and you don't need to even read the rest of it because you don't need the rest of the, the uh, rights that the license actually uh, describes. Um, okay. um, GPL versus AGPL, as I said, um, in copyleft, in traditional copyleft licenses, um, the trigger is on distribution. And when we're dealing with SaaS, there is no distribution, apart from client side JavaScript. Um, that's traditionally distributed. Um, so, AGPL, which is one of the first licenses that tackled this situation, um, it triggers the copyleft clause on uh, modification and network use. So first of all, you need to have somebody interact with a piece of software through the internet. So for, as I said, for example, um, if you have a Nextcloud instance and you give them an account and they can you know, upload files and comment and use all the other apps there, that would count as you know, interacting through the network, so network use. The other part of it is that an AGPL is that you modify the code. So um, if you didn't modify, let's not go into that. That's like very specific. But um, the other thing is to take care is uh, to, to take note is that uh, other uh, network copyleft licenses are the European Union public license, which is something you might more realistically run into, and the open source license and its derivatives, which is less likely you're running into. Um, okay, how many of you are actually programming? And, uh, okay, there's a few. Okay. So this might be interesting. Um, languages? Which languages? Python and Java. Python and Java. Python and Java. Okay. So, as I said, with LGPL, um, it, you can separate the library license from the rest of the work, um, which is handy, uh, which means that you can you know, include an LGPL component, an LGPL library, into, for example, a proprietary license uh, solution. Um, under the condition that you can make sure that your downstream can remove the LGPL component and swap it for a different version of it. So you need to, so the, the license, so the LGPL license will apply to all the code that is needed for that operation to happen. Make sense? All right. So the, the difference between LGPL 2 and LGPL 2.1, and later on also 3, 
uh, is that 221 introduced the dynamic linking exception. So in static linking or like more complex languages like C, uh, C++, et cetera, or C sharp as well, um, you have the option whether you statically or dynamically link. Um, and in that case, it would mean you would need to release some of your own code under the LGPL as well for that operation to be possible. Um, but if it's a shared object that you can dynamically link, um, like for example in Java and Python, um, if, you, if, the li if the library is under the LGPL 2.1 or LGPL 3, um, then you don't need to do anything else than just declare where, where the code is. So this is the component. Here you can get the whole copy of the source code of that component. And that's it, because they can just swap it on the fly as is. Uh, for other languages like Go, which is inherently static and anything, um, it doesn't make a difference at all. Um, the other thing that's more common is you're going to see an orator clause, uh, which, especially with GPL licenses, it means if you see GPL 2.0 only, it would mean that GPL 2.0 applies to that piece of software. If it says GPL 2.0 or later, it means that you can choose whether you want to follow the GPL 2. version 2, <laughs> GPL version 3, or in the future, maybe version 4, um, if you want to. Um, and the weird thing about the GPL family of licenses is if it doesn't say which version applies at all, you can choose any that ever existed. Um, the same, the similar, it's a similar thing is, is, is also in Creative Commons licenses. I think from version 2.5 onward, so even if you find a piece of uh, a content under CC by 2.5, um, you can still apply um, CC by 4.0 to it because it says in the license text itself, it says that if there is a newer version, you can decide to opt in and use the newer version of the license if that is more suitable to what you want. Um, does anybody, this is, this is probably going to be weird, but does anybody, has anybody watched Lucky Loop? Does anybody know Lucky Loop? Okay, there's a few. Okay, good. So the joke works. Um, BSD is a famous group of licenses um, because it was one of the first open source licenses, and BSD was one of the first open source uh, uh, open source uh, operating systems. So BSD stands for Berkeley Software Distribution, and there's four of them, um, and it's we start with the old one, with the original BSD. Uh, which we nowadays call the four clause BSD, or as I like to call it, the Avril Dow the big one, the big stupid guy. <laughs> um, what, the reason why it's called the four clause is because it has four clauses. That's simple. So the first clause says that you can use this piece of software under for everything or anything you want, as long as you make sure that you keep the copyright and license notices in source code. If you distribute the source code, um, you all do the same in binary, so you need to state somewhere that there is BSD software here and those are the authors. Um, then there was a kind of annoying advertisement clause that says this is blah blah Berkeley and you need to put it in big red letter, letters everywhere that you got code from Berkeley, uh, which may be incompatible with the GPL licenses. And for new reasons, it also had the fourth clause that said, oh, by the way, you need to say anywhere that this is, you know, you got the code from Berkeley, but we totally, you know, that doesn't mean we endorse whatever you did to the software. And, okay, so first thing that happened, obviously, is somebody notified Berkeley that this is incompatible with other big license in open source like that, which was the GPL. So they asked it. Um, so this is called the three clause BSD because they removed the third clause and now it just has three. So it's a slightly shorter one, like Jack Dalton, which was one of the you know normal guys. Um, so this is also called the new or revised BSD license because that's the one they actually use nowadays. 
Um, then somebody came along and said, you know, the, the whole world was in fast in fact, stupid. They got rid of that, like the short term. And it's like the William Duff, the other brother that was kind of okay. Um, and then somebody came and said, you know, I actually don't give a flying what to do with the binary. So, um, <coughs> as you can imagine, that was a short, angry group, I imagine, like Joe. Um, and it only requires you to, if you, if you distribute the sources, uh, you also need to include the notices uh, and source code, but if you just do a closed source binary thing, you don't need to mention anything. There's also zero cost because you, but let's not go into that. Um, okay, so some licenses in context. Mm. So other permissive licenses like uh, also include MIT uh, or Apache. So use Apache if you are worried about patents. Um, if you're super worried about patents. Um, many lawyers will agree in the field that MIT and BSD, while not explicitly talking about patents, do include a patent license, but this was never tested in court. So I am in the group that sees that that way as well. But if you really want to make sure that people know that if there's any patents attached, that they get a license to it as well. And if you get attacked by anybody with a patent, that they lose the license to the software, um, then use Apache 2.0. Uh, that makes it very explicit. Um, we copy that, as I said, differs in scope. So um, the LGPL covers the library, whatever that is. Um, the Mozilla public license uh, only applies to the individual files. It's you, you, file it, you find the license name in. And the same is true for Eclipse public license 2.0. Um, previously, Eclipse uh, 0, uh, Eclipse 1.0 license applied to a module, which was basically the same problem as with the library. So if you start using the people, people use these licenses also in non-modules and non-libraries, and they thought, um, as I said, Scrum Pop covers the whole derivative work, and what a derivative work is has some technical questions, some technical questions, um, there's some legal questions, there's often quite a lot of tooling and a lot of detail analysis involved to figure out what the derivative work is in practice. Um, but yeah, that's the gross oversimplification of the situation. Um, we only have different pieces of software and we merge them together. Take some code on the web, decide somewhere, take some code on GitHub and then smush them together, write some new code around it and then you call it research. Um, I'm joking. So, um, but then in practice, I, I work in an IT company. That's that's how it often starts. It is, it's here, so it's there, and it's blue code and match. Um, so if we so so in this graph, your own code is orange, and the green parts are um, third party open source stuff. So if you combine a your code with uh, some strong copy of code. If it's a strong separation, so for example, a strong copy separation would be if it's a separate runtime. So for example, if uh, <clears throat> you wrote a piece of software that did some you know magic data analysis thing, but it also needed to um, OCR. Um, Texts, so you've got like PDFs or images that you need to know what it actually says. You would probably not implement a new OCR system yourself. That's a bit tedious. So you would download Tesseract or something like that, like an open source solution that exists. But what you would do is usually you would, you know, your software would run and I would say, oh, there's an image. Uh, we need to figure out if there's text in the image. And then it would say, is Tesseract installed? Okay, I found the runtime for Tesseract. Hey Tesseract, can you look at this folder and OCR all the images in that folder? Let me know when you're finished and store the text files in this other folder. Um, and then your code goes through the text in uh, the text files in another folder. So that would be a strong separation because you the Tesseract just had to be installed in the system. 
Um, it's the same true with if you call web APIs like REST, uh, REST APIs. If you do anything else, <laughs> basically, if you there's in, any more intimate interaction between two pieces of code, it's very likely the derivative work. So GPL would apply to the whole thing, also to your code. Um, in uh, a weak copy lab situation, like LGPL, if again, if you cannot separate the LGPL piece of code from uh, your code, it's a derivative, and the whole thing has to be under LGPL. If though you can make it so you can pull out the library or whatever that component is and change it for a different one, so that's a good rule of thumb uh, test. Um, then you just need to release that part under the LGPL, and you can license your own part under whatever. With permissive licenses, it gets a bit weird because if you can change, if you can take the part out, um, that part stays under the BSD license, for example. Um, and you can you know, license everything else however you want. But if you cannot pull that part out, um, the BSD license code is suddenly re-licensed under your own license. Counterintuitive, but it ultimately doesn't matter much. Um, makes sense? OK, cool. So there's two other graphs um, we can look at. Um, but I'm not going to go into those right now. So, obviously, now that you created a piece of software, whether it includes third party software or not, uh, you want to choose a license for it. Because, again, if you don't have a license, if you don't attach a license, nobody is able to use it. Um, <clears throat> so, there's things you need to consider when you're choosing a license. It makes sense to consider them as soon as possible so you don't run into the situation. Maybe in academia that's not so much of a problem, but in, in, in open source projects it gets into that problem really fast. When you suddenly be, uh, get more and more contributors, uh, which means you have more and more copyright holders, more and more authors, and you now have a piece of code that has like 20, maybe 100 people who own code, who, who, who own the copyright in the project, and you need to coordinate between all of them uh, which license you all agree the, uh, the project will be under. Uh, it obviously makes it a lot easier if you do it one, while you're still alone or there's five um, So the things you need to consider is the use case, as I said, whether it's a traditional distribution or you think it's going to be used as a SaaS. Um, also, you need to make sure that your license or your outbound license is compatible with your inbound licenses and the inbound licenses are compatible with itself. And um, yeah, that it makes sense to also make sure into which ecosystem you're going to launch that. So if, for example, if you're writing a library for the Go language, because the way Go language works, um, they're very skeptical of, of, um, of uh, copyleft licenses, because as soon as you introduce any piece of copyleft license into the Go ecosystem, um, if anybody pulls down that uh, piece of code, because it's static linking, there's no way around it, like the whole thing <laughs> needs to be under the GPL. Maybe in certain cases, they really want to avoid it. So, on a piece of advice, if you write Go, uh, even if you like copyleft, nobody will use the copyleft. Um, I like copyleft, but if, if in Go, people will not use a copyleft piece of software. So some recommendations from my side is if you think it's going to be a desktop view kind of use, so like a traditional distribution is going to run on a desktop or on a mobile phone or something like that, um, and you want to make sure that the software remains open source, so even if others use it and change it, that they need to give it as open source to them downstream, ideally, <coughs> ideally you also publish that source code. Um, then you use uh, GPL 3.0 or later, so in case GPL 4 pops up. Um, if you're also worried that it's going to be installed on a server, uh, so it's going to put into the cloud, um, and there's a problem then, um, then you might consider AGPL or OSL or European Union public license. Um, if, on the other hand, 
Uh, so if, if you're creating libraries and you just, or, or other pieces of code where you don't care what people do with them, but you just want to make sure that if they modify the library or they modify the files that you released, that they need to release, uh, to also um, keep those as open source and use one of the weak copyright licenses like Eclipse, Mozilla, uh, or the LGPL. Um, if you don't care what happens with the code, but you are, for example, implementing a standard, or there's some um, example code or uh, proof of concept stuff that you need. That, that you think you, everybody needs to use, um, and you don't care whether it ends up in a closed source project or an open source project, whatever, um, then use one of the permissive licenses like MIT, BSD, Apache, if you're worried about patents. Um, if you want to release it as public domain, as far as it, you can, um, you can kind of with the unlicensed MIT zero, zero BSD. Uh, um, and CC0, uh, with the caveat that all Creative Commons licenses, including CC0, are not well suited for software and explicitly do not carry a patent license. So, now, like a month ago, I started noticing some companies uh, explicitly said that they will not use software, not data, but just software, that's released under CC0, uh, because it happened that there were a few. Um, bad actors who released code under CC0 as a poison pill. So you installed it, oh, that's probably the way, whatever. And then they came back and said, well, you know, yes, then we have patents. <laughs> um, so take that into consideration. Unlicensed is, legally speaking, a crappy written license, so I would probably navigate towards these two. Um, but uh, that's it. Um, and in practice, if you if you have European Union and um, funding, they might force you to use the EUPL. Um, it's in a lot of their contracts. Um, it's not a bad license. Uh, it's very close to AGPL. Um, just in written a very much more understandable language. It has some legal specifics, um, which is why especially some American lawyers don't like it. But other than that, it's not actually not. Okay, so, but you know, don't take my word for it. There are some helper um, websites out there uh, that help you choose a license. Um, each of them, those are the three of the best ones that I could find. Um, all of them carry a certain bias. Um, and I think I actually think that the join up one is the least biased, so the European one is the least biased. But um, I would suggest if you're looking for a license, just Take all of them for a spin and see what happens, and then make a make a decision. Okay. So now, we're, yes. Um, is there any difference uh, between uh, open source uh, softwares and playable uh, software or uh, SaaS um, in in sense of um, security of data? Um. There's no there is no connection. There is um, the security of data and quality uh, and security of the of um, and safety of the code is completely has to do with the quality of the code. So how well the software was written. Um, there's an argument that that uh, you know one one side will say that because the code is public, it's easier to abuse it. The other side would say because the code is public, um, it is under a bigger scrutiny of the public eye, so more people look at it and more you know, security researchers point out issues before they are actually abused. For example, can we use um, software that is uh, with open source codes for making service uh, questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, a, I think, even the European Union, this, I think in Slovenia there's a ANCA, it's quite popular, that's open source ish. Um, it has an open source version. Um, you can install it yourself. And the uh, European Union's uh, survey, the, I think it's called, actually called EU surveys. <laughs> Is really robust and really secure. 
Um, and it's also based on their development of license. So you can either use those as a service or install it yourself. I don't know what the policy of you know, University of Manila is. Um, I would not, but um, my personal recommendation would be to not use uh, third party services where you don't have access to the data. But, um, that's my personal preference on it. Not, 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 not an expert advice. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Now that we got to the point where we actually have some code that we wrote, we want to mark your own code. And as a consequence, make sure that the code has been used by others. Uh, why? Well, as you said, we have no license, but we can use it, so we will use it. Um, it's also, it's your own code, I mean, you be proud of it, you know, slap your, head, slap your name on it, let people know you wrote that. And stuff. So, luckily there's some, um, there some, some best practices out there, it's not a standard per se, but it's used by, I, I know it's used by tens of thousands of uh, packages and repositories out there, including the Linux kernel, um, which is called reuse.software. Um, it's super simple. Uh, it basically has like three requirements, so three steps. Step one is choose a license and provide the license text to it. Uh, step two is add copyright and licensing information in every file, and here's the important part, in every file in the repository. The reason why I need to do it in every file, um, repeat that because a lot of people say at some point, first it sounds easy, but at some point it's all that easy. Um, because, you know, when people mix and match codes, so you guys probably do that as well, you find a piece of software somewhere and you don't need the whole thing, you just need those three files. And you copy those files. And then, you know, suddenly you have your code with two files from that project, one file from that project, two files from that other project. And you slap, for example, like BSD on your project. Are those five files actually are in the BSD and who is the copyright holder? Because if somebody looks at it and doesn't know where those things came from, and they don't, um, it looks like you wrote those, which would be plagiarism. <coughs> Not a good idea. Um, and uh, also, they might assume they're under a BSD license, but maybe they're under a BPL, or maybe they're under a patch, who knows? So that's why I stress that it makes sense the reuse. Uh, specification stresses that you need to include license information in every single file because if the file moves, it stays with the file. That's the only reliable way um, you can make it. Um, if you're interested about copyright headers, and there's a lot of interesting things about copyright headers, I wrote a blog post about it. It's really long. But the reason I wrote it because there was no one single uh, resource online uh, that explains <coughs> the whole weirdness of copyright statements. <coughs> um, and then optional, the third step is to check whether the, your repository or package is compliant with the spec. Um, there's luckily tooling for that. There's a linter tool that we're going to use in a few minutes. And there's also a web API that you can call that you register your project and then on GitHub or GitLab or wherever, you then get a nice little badge that you can put in your repository and people will like you more. Um, cool. So, this is the format um, of the header that you need to put into every file and source code. So, it starts with an SPDX tag called Fire Copyright Text, which means that the following copyright statement uh, applies to this file we found this in. And then the next one is the SPDX tag for a uh, license identifier, which is a short name for a, a standardized short name for a specific license. In this case, it would be BSD3+. Plus. So anybody who would see this in a file that I wrote will know, okay, this is copyright by idea. Um, and he wrote it in 2021. 
Um, and he released it under the BSD3 license. That's as simple as that. Um, if, you know, there's an example, if it's not a physical person, but it's a, a company or a project or whatever, then maybe instead of an email, you can put a website or a homepage. Okay, uh, demo time. Um, are you guys tired? Do you want to have a like, five minute break after this, or yes. do you prefer a okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really five minutes because yeah. we have a big demo afterwards as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you. I'm just going to demo this first because then it's a uh, uh, jump um, to a different topic. So we have the, here, we have a very simple Python uh, repository. And as I said, there's this lint tool called reuse lint. And if we run it, it says we are not compliant with the spec. Does anybody see this? Okay. So why is it not compliant? Because we have no uh, files with the copyright information and we have no files with the license information. But luckily, the reuse tool also has a. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to keep it short. Uh, I know who the copyright owner is, um, but I, we're going we're gonna to fake it like it's mine. Um, <laughs> best example. Um, so we're going to reuse add header um, and. We're going to say, okay, so we say add header to all of the files. So we see the, the double asterisk. So to all the, of the files in this folder, uh, we're going to license it under the MIT license. Um, we're going to use the copyright style as a symbol, which is my preferred style, but you can use whatever. Um, and we're going to say that the copyright is held by that hacker who has this funky email address. And let's see what happens. Oh, okay. We got some error. Huh. Okay. It's, uh, there are some files that you can, that it doesn't recognize the extension for. So the thing is, what happens, what it does is the reuse at header from command, it looks at the file type and it then guesses what is the comment um, form for that file, and if it can't guess it, it's going to error. Okay, so no problem. We'll just add the skip unrecognized flag, and it should work. I skipped a few, but in general it worked. So let's see what the linter says now. Okay, so it added five files with license and, and copyright information, and also found that we are, in fact, declaring MIT as a license. Nice. So, what we are left with is this, okay, there's this getting more thing. And we're just going to add uh, CC0, because git ignore is, you know, it's it's not copyrightable. Well, git ignore is basically a list, a file where you declare which files in the repository you don't want git to track. I mean, there's no originality in that. It's not a poem, it's not a haiku. You could probably turn it into one if you really, really want it, but it usually it's not. So I don't care about that. I'm just going to slap CC0 on it. All right, so that's that. Um, but we're still missing the obelisk thing. Okay, what's the obelisk thing? Let's see what the obelisk thing is. Oh, okay. Obelix is a Python script which somebody forgot to add the dot .py uh, suffix. So what we'll do is we'll just do obelix, obelix. Um, and we're going to force the Python uh, the Python comment style on it, and this should work. So if we say Obelix again, it, it works. So it created a comment which includes the file copyright text tag and the license identifier with MIT. 
Nice. <coughs> okay, what is else is there? Uh, so I think there was something in its resources. Ah. Okay, so these are some text files, like plain text files, which is, again, they don't have any way of comments uh, in them. Um, you can check one to see what it actually is. No. Uh, that's, that's oh, so it's... I would argue this is not something we can call like a very original. Does anybody think this looks like a prose or a poem or a piece of actually working software? It's just to me, it looks just like just some data. Uh, let's just say we're gonna do the same and and. Add uh, a add the CC zero license to it, um, but because the text files don't have their own um, method of commenting in line, uh, we need to force a so-called dot license. So a dot license flag in this case and reuse is a interesting way of. Um, so for the for the examples where you cannot append, uh, where, where you cannot comment in the file itself, um, it would then uh, it would then append it and it create use the same data and store it into a separate file. So in, in this file, as you can see, it's the same name as the original file. So this stuff. Blah blah dot txt um, dot license is the file where you will find the license uh, information for the base file. Okay, so that's still not happening. Huh, why not? It said that all the files have copywriting or all the files have licensing. Oh, but if we don't have the license text, huh, all right, luckily. Reuse also has a handy dandy download tool. So if you say reuse download flag all, it will check which licenses are used in the code and download them. So for example, we can see in the licenses folder, we can see there is now a MIT license. Okay, so reuse lint is now happy. We finally have a reuse compliant uh, repository. And all it took us was five, right? it could be done in three or two uh, command lines, uh, line, uh, commands, but because we had some weirdness with the data texts and all that, we needed to create some more. So all we did was um, add the add the headers to uh, these files and create, or we cannot, we created these files. And the beauty of reuse is uh, all you need to know, if you want to know what license that we use compatible, how we use compliant repository is or packages, all you need to do is look in the licenses folder and you will have you will have the SPDX identification IDs of the file of the licenses that apply. So those are the only two licenses that apply. And that's all you need to know. Um, okay, so call it five minutes and then we continue. We're a bit late and I have a whole other slide there. Um, so as I said, the second part is going to be about um, inbound compliance and some tooling uh, to make your life easier. So the plan is that we first discuss why uh, license compliance matters. Then we're going to check two ISO standards that make things easier. And time permitting, we'll end up with uh, a tools demo. 
um, or some of the tools that are make your life a lot easier in uh, this field. So, so first question is why water? Um, as explained, the license compliance. Um, so you, you need to comply with the licenses in order to have a license. So if it says you need to, you need to keep the copyright statements intact, you need to take copyright statements uh, to keep copyright statements intact. If it says you need to forward the uh, the open source um, the, the source code to your downstream, you need to forward the source code to your downstream. If you have that, if you don't, you violate the license. And if you buy the delay the license, you're suddenly in a situation where you're infringing copyright. And that's a bad idea. Um, because it can have civil repercussions, which usually means money. Um, and in certain cases, it can also lead to criminal repercussions, which means two things. One is even more money, uh, potentially jail. Um, and the other problem is, um, especially if you're dealing in fields uh, where high trust is required, um, if you have to be banned from, uh, from getting a job. Um, not very, I'm making it sound more scary than it is. I don't think anybody actually got to criminal court because they broke all the process. Um, especially if they didn't do it voluntarily and um, repeat the matter. But still, in theory, that's how it is. Okay, so what do you need to watch out for? This is going to be a lot of repeat stuff, so I'm going to be really quick. Um, you need to make sure that the licenses, the inbound licenses are compatible with each other, and that they're compatible with your, your own license or with your outbound license. You need to keep the license text in place, and you just learn how you do that really easily with the we used to, uh, and then you keep all the copyright notices, which again, could be easy, just don't freaking remove them. It's, it's weird how many, how, how many people just remove them. And it's like super simple to not to, to comply with that. You just don't do anything with them. Um, then property market owner, which we already covered. Um, then you know, if copy lab, then this, and then you need to offer the source code, etc. Um, what also interesting is that um, once you decide upon your license, um, it makes also sense to look at your downstream so and your end users. But who are your target audiences? Well, whoever it is, is it general public? Is it other researchers? Is it the open source community? Is it, is it specific customers or whatever? So the reason why you need to also take that into consideration is that if you want others to use it, then you need to make sure that you give them the rights that they want and that they can use. Um, and that means both your license as well as the upstream license, as the inbound license. Um, so there's four important questions that a lawyer could really ask themselves when, when they encounter a third party piece of software. Is like, who owns the rights? So who's the copyright holder? Once the license applies, um, have you modified the code? This is specifically important for certain copyright licenses, not copyright licenses. And how do the different license pieces interact? And as I said. In the previous slide deck, if you're using a third party software, so a different component in the runtime or some like web API, it's not in the work. Uh, whereas if you are linking uh, or copy pasting code into your own code, it's fairly likely. You know, which again matters in the situation that uh, you're viewing with copy addresses. So, luckily, in the past few years, we suddenly have some standards uh, to help uh, license compliance. So the first one is OpenJail. Um, so I've been doing this a lot in the past hour or so um, because it you know shows the supply chain. So you have your upstream, you have your entity, and you have your downstream. And because everybody in the supply chain, the supply chain typically consists of more than just three. Uh, check out uh, three uh, elements. It usually is a very long and you know, uh, branch style situation. Um, so, in the past, like in every step, in every inbound to outbound situation, the entity in question would, would uh, 
do their own due diligence and they would scan all the software they got and that would become very tedious very fast. So um, ISO standard uh, came to be uh, called OpenChain. It started as a community standard but then it got into ISO uh, procedure for itself. Um, and what it does is it, <coughs> it prescribes a minimum standard for FOSS compliance and certification for that. So you can self-certify, uh, which is cool. Um, and what it does is, is so if, if a company like ours is OpenJ combined, it means that we have people, policies, and processes in place um, that deal with open source compliance, so licenses in general. So if a customer of ours comes and says, okay, I have a question regarding your open source compliance, I see your open chain compliance. Um, they already know they have somebody to talk to, which in this case would be um, and that we have uh, proper policies and processes that we apply, and they can ask, you know, instead of trying to figure out what we do, they can just ask us, so, what's your process, what's your policy, what are the compliance artifacts, and we need to get it to you. Uh, that's, that, that's a really cool one. Um, maybe overkill for you guys right now, but um, something to keep in mind, especially if you later on go to to um, <coughs> to, to corporate. So the other standard is SPDX. So SPDX stands for Software Package Data Exchange, and it's an ISO standard for communicating a software bill of material. Um, a software bill of material is basically a list of all the components that go into a package. Um, in this case, on a file level, um, sometimes even you know, on a snippet level granularity. Um, and it includes information, amongst others, it's like a hundred plus pages long uh, specification. Um, it includes information on what are the components that are in there, uh, what should licenses and who hold the copyright, uh, any security references if a tool was used to generate those, uh, what are the relationships, so like, does it dynamically link, is it a reference, or etc, etc, between different pieces of software in there, and other technical details. So, you've seen SPDX mentioned a lot in the previous slides, which is because, apart from just the document, so the, what we call an SPDX document, which it is the software bill of material, um, SPDX also had to invent its own language and syntax, which we're going to check into uh, shortly, as well as uh, unique IDs for licenses. So before SPDX came to be, um, people had different names for different licenses, and the same name for different versions of a similar license that was in practice a different license. Um, and the SPDX standardized that, so we now have um, a list of uh, SPDX checked licenses. So, as I said, if I say BSD3 clause, and people know that's an SPDX tag, everybody will know exactly which license I'm talking about. Which is really cool. So, um, when it comes to words and syntax of the SPDX language, um, so, uh, for example, again, with the BSD, like the full unique name of uh, the, that license is BSD3 clause, new or revised license, and the short name is BSD3 clause, and you know, that's the link to all the licenses that are in the standard. Um, so, which means that, I mean, I'm using an LGPL example here, but um, a SPDX identifier that you can put into the source code would be an SPDX license identifier, um, and in this case it could be BSD3 clause. Um, you can also use more complex expressions, um, like in this case, where this piece of software in question includes both code under the Apache 2.0 license and some code that is dual licensed under MIT or GPL 2.0. So which means for that piece of code, I know I can choose between these two licenses and there's a different piece of code that's under Apache license. And uh, SPDX languages and work with and uh, plus as well as parentheses to make things easier. These are some important SPDX tags. We're just going to look at that in, uh, in practice in the demo. Um, third standard, which is for change, not an ISO standard, but it's but the SPDX refers to it, is URL, which stands for a package URL. 
Um, similar to um, SBX IDs, what Perl tries to fix and is pretty good at it is um, when you need to figure out where, where, where you got the software from or which package um, it is. It's, as I said, like not, like software as a piece of work is different uh, from commit to commit. And that's not just from the legal point of view, it's also from the technical point of view. Like one commit or one version could have some issues that another version doesn't. So, and where you got it from might also matter. So, Perl fixes that by having a syntax uh, schema. Uh, uh, for example, in this case would be okay, so this was a package that was taken from the NPM package manager. The package is called foolbar and it's version 12.3.1. In this case, it's okay, I got it from GitHub, from the organization BioLab. The project is called, the repository is called Orange 3, and it's uh, this commit. Um, you can also add other things, like you can have, like after a hash sign, you can have the subclass. So, in this but in this project, in this repository, I'm only interested in the annotations file within the Google API, API's API format. Uh, so super useful to mark which which uh, package or which file you got from where. Okay, so, so useful tools and services. This is going to be more interesting to you guys to actually go. Um, uh, First one is that I'm going to go from the most easy to use, um, less work, to more complex and specific. Um, the first one is Clearly Defined, which is a web service and REST API uh, that you can use. Um, it uh, stores license and copyright data that you've got from a different license cards. <coughs> and, um, you when you check a when you check a package on it, you see which licenses it found and uh, which copyright it found in the package, um, and it also like it introduces a confidence uh, confidence score, so how well defined that package is. Um, personally, I'm very very pedantic when it comes to this. I only trust uh, the score that's above eighty seven percent. But um, you know, some people might be okay with 50s. Um, if we look at it in short, um, this is how it looks like. So, for example, let's look at this one because it's here. So it has a confidentiality score of 74, which is okay. Um, I might still, if it looks funny, I might still scan it myself with my own tools. But um, if you click on it, it says, um, okay, I found um, eight files. I found two licenses in there, so two files with a license. And I found a three licenses with an attribution inside. <clears throat> so the package manager um, said this is MIT. Um, but in fact, when I looked at it, I found MIT and MIT and no assertion, which is a separate way. So this, this is it, again, this is an SPDX annotation. SPDX annotation is very widely used uh, nowadays. And I also found a copyright statement, uh, which says this is copyrighted by VeriSign, and by N3O, and I have no copyright statement by N3O. So this is really easy to do. So if you just want to see, okay, which licenses are included, you know, check on clearly defined, if it has a nice score, if it's if the icon is at least green, it's already good. If the icon is red, it's uh, no. Don't don't even bother. Um, okay. So failing that, uh, you can use a scanner to uh, locally uh, <coughs> a scan code, which is a Python uh, project. It's very easy to install. Um, is Scanner is one of the best, one of the two actually really good scanners um, out there. Uh, all of the tools that I mentioned are open source, which is download them. Um, what it does is it you scan a piece of software, so you need to use the source code, um, and you run on it, 
and in the CLI, and it then scans for license uh, and copyright information files, and then it summarizes it. Um, it has several output formats, um, SPDX being the most common, obviously. Um, and, uh, <coughs> yeah. That's what I usually use when I have to do something really quick. It's also well suited for a CI. Um, the bigger package, if you now need to you know, do a more broad check, um, I would use OSS the OSS really toolkit, which is an even wider toolkit uh, with an emphasis on CI. It's again a CLI tool, but I was going to call them. Um, and this one has several steps. So first, the analyzer um, generates from the build files, it generates uh, a whole dependency tree. All the dependencies as deep as it can get. And then the downloader figures out what are the source code uh, for those versions of those dependencies and downloads all of that. So can we get, can we get some traffic and some this usage, um, and then the scanner, which is usually scan code in practice, then scans all of those packages, and then you have, you know, advisor evaluator and reporter to do some stuff, like a report or um, warn you on incompatibilities or something like that. Um, all of the tools so far are command line interface only, so if you need to, if you use them, um, and you then suddenly need to parse, like, really, really big um, texts of uh, license information. Uh, uh, it can be a bit tedious. So there's a awesome UI, which is a auditing and reviewing tool um, that you can then import either SPDX or the internal format of uh, scan code or uh, <laughs> ORT. And um, it then has a web UI or a desktop uh, web UI. Um, that you can then easily navigate through the file structure and check, okay, this is, this is the right attribution, this is the right license, uh, no, I don't agree with that, you know, I checked, it's actually a different license, or that's actually not a copyright statement, it's a weird screen, and fix that. Um, another approach would be using Fosology, which we use in our company often, uh, which is basically awesome and scan code combined. So, Fosology is a similar tool, so it's also a licensed copyright uh, scanner that actually has different scanning agents. So, it has a different approach as how it finds licenses. Um, and um, it also checks for export control and patent uh, language if you need to care about that. It has a web UI <coughs> as a web API. And as such, it's um, made with an audited workflow in mind. So, um, if Scarecrow and ORT are something you run and then you keep you know, in the background just churning away, um, and then you check the output, um, you don't have any conclusions. You just have a tool that creates an output. Um, then you either use uh, a possum UI to have a human audit that data and uh, clean it up, or you just use Fosology from the start and you know, have that process uh, from the beginning. Personally, I, for, simple, for simple packages, I just use Scanfold, um, and if it looks fishy, then I open it and you know, possibly buy or then use Fosology. Um, but for work stuff, I usually use Fosology. And it gets even more complicated if you need uh, to handle different components uh, for different projects that need a software capital manager like uh, Software 360. Um, and there's even more specialized tools like um, SPDX tools so to handle SPDX documents. Turn is uh, the best uh, scanner for uh, Docker images if you need to deal with Docker images and figure out what goes in what licenses apply, etc. and that's a whole lot. I don't have my source for that. Um, so turn is really good. Um, bang is binary analysis next generation is if you need to figure out what goes into or what went into a ROM or firmware image. 
Um, and there's a lot of other uh, uh, similar lifestyle tools that are on this website. Uh, so it's a really useful website. Um, Tangent, so it's a tool, but it has nothing to do with license compliance per se. But if you need a CLA, you probably don't. If you need a CLA for your project, okay, uh, contribute a license. There's, I would suggest two things. One is to check the FLA, uh, which is a uh, really well balanced uh, CLA that allows the uh, person who, or the entity who gets the copyright, the exclusive rights, um, to do whatever they need to do, but also gives the appropriate rights back to the contributors as well as make sure that the software, even if there's a commercial version, also always has to have an open source version. So that's the FLA, the commercial license agreement. You can find it here. So if you need a CLA, I would ask you to at least check this out. And if you need it, um, I will also really recommend that you use a CLA assistant or something like that, which is a tool to simplify um, <coughs> uh, signing of CLAs and uh, repository. Um, we have five minutes. Now I can show you, it's probably going to be easier if, if I don't go like that, I'll just show the recording. So this is going to be a short, uh, short. Uh, demo or uh, scan code. <laughs> so basically there's a there's this project called uh, Orange that well, that I scanned with scan code. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's got a lot of Python and some text files, etc. So we use <coughs> scan code flag package info copyright license, which means that it's going to look at um, the package information in the package, um, other information, as well as scan for copyright and license occurrences. We will also output it in SPDX format tag value, which is an old format. You would probably nowadays use uh, JSON or uh, YAML, um, which is also a valid SPDX format now. And output it to SPDX. Uh, but we also wanted to do an RDF uh, version of it because that's a big one. And I'm going to skip this because there's, you don't need to see the progress work. OK, so this is the output then. Um, so as you see, it took some time. It checked uh, several files. Uh, and now we're going to see, so we, we see that it created two files as you asked it. And this is the, <clears throat> this is the, uh, when I mentioned it before, that there are some useful uh, tags in, um, so, you know, from the license compliance point of view, some useful tags in the SPDX documents. So, okay. Uh, okay. So we have, um, if we, we check the orange 3 SPDX, which is the tag value output, and we search for all occurrences of file copyright text. As you may remember, that's the tag we used to indicate um, copyright uh, notices. And we're going to do something that we're going to sort it by alphabet and then uh, only uh, and then aggregate them into, deduplicate them into. Uh, with unique and count. So we find that most of the files have no copyright uh, notice in this project, but we also found like a few from Andre, um, one from the Spider project, uh, one from a guy I know, and Google for some reason, um, and then like, 
two different studies of orange data mining um, and also bioinformatics lab. Um, so that's you know that's this we were, that, that the orange SPDX is the output of Scanco. Um, and these are the copyright uh, notices it found in the source code. So if we do the same and search for license info in file, which is um, the tag the tag for um, a license a tool found in the file. We see it gets a bit more complicated. Yeah, there's still like most of the files because this was not a really compliant um, project. But most of the files didn't have any license attached. There's two with MIT, uh, there's one with Apache 2.1. Um, there's um, 18 with GPL3 only and 4 with GPL3 or later. There's also 18 with LGPL 2.1 or later and 18 with LGPL 3 only. So it's a mix. And um, I have it here. Uh, we can see. Um, yeah, I mean, the text itself says that's under the GPL 3 or later. So that's, the, that's what the project says itself in the readme file. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at the analysis, it, it's a bit more complicated, right? Um, yeah. And this is now how the how the um, file, so the SPX file looks like if you look at it. So we have, for example, like, <clears throat> it has a file name tag which you know it says okay, so orange three GitHub workflows on the other. Um, that's not a good example. Oh, this is a good example. Um, so this uh, pilot diff thing. Um, it has, it carries the file checksum, so it has a shell one checksum. So you know if the, so the SPDX, if, if um, somebody messes with the code, um, the SPDX file will not match because it will notice that the, the SHA uh, checksum is going to be different from what it was recorded in the document. Um, and here we see that like, this is the one where the copyrights of Kevin's Google and others um, it found Apache 2.1 as the license in there, the tool. Um, and license concluded is, as I said, that there's the audit workflow. Um, so SPDX also allows for, apart from the, it stores data, it stores data separately if it was stored, it was found by a tool, which it would, in this case, would be this. So a tool found this. But if I then later on checked it myself and I said, okay, I, as the auditor, checked it and I agree that this file is indeed under Apache, it was put it here. It would say under the license concluded. So that would be a human conclusion uh, of the data. And because the, the, this was scan code, there was no human involved um, and there's no assertion. So no human is asserting anything about this. Yeah, and this is just to prove that this file indeed has a copyright notice by Kevin Google, etc., and it says it's licensed under Apache or license license too. And this is also where it, where it found the MIT license in one of the other files. So this is the source code. Um, and it found it like in somewhere it actually mentions that MIT. So it's a really good scan. Um, I can perhaps steal just three more minutes from your time to show how a possum looks like. So you see that there is, in fact, also uh, UIs available. Um, again, this is a very early. Uh, Project. Um, there are more robust, so the is a lot more robust than, than uh, 
this is so this is a different project. So this was again uh, was scanned by ScanCode, um, and I scanned a very common component called Zenlib. Um, and for example, you can see like in, in red it means that it found stuff, but it didn't. So nobody audited it yet. So here I would say, okay, so deflate.c file. Uh, it didn't find any licenses, but it found a Oh, it did find, it did find a copyright notice here, and it did find a Zebra license. And I said, okay, I agree with that. And it would copy the copyright, the copyright notice here, and it would store the license here. Um, now we see it's green. So, interesting here is, let me see if I can find function. And here again, we have a different one, and it says, okay, scan code. Um, this. And, okay. I say, okay, I agree on that. This is copyright Henry Baker, and it's under the Boost software license. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. We're five minutes past the hour, but uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Otherwise, I'll see you.